That white knuckle raid may have ended with the letters E-K-I-A for enemy killed in action. But that was just the beginning of what we're learning tonight as the FBI and CIA pour over the material seized from bin Laden's compound. Among the treasure trove, an Al-Qaeda playbook outlining plots against the water supply, planes and trains. Experts are checking the handwriting to see if bin Laden personally wrote it. Experts are also looking at Al-Qaeda's obsession with anniversaries and symbolic dates, including the biggest one of all, the upcoming 10th anniversary of 9-11. So tonight we've got all those latest details, everything that went into Operation Neptune Spear. For that, we go to our colleague who knows this story best, Martha Raddatz. Let me just comment, first of all, on the fact that... Uh, Hard as it is to believe now, this is what passed for news last week. And many of you have been briefed. We provided additional information today about uh, the site of my birth. We do not have time for this kind of silliness. We got better stuff to do. Better stuff indeed. At this very moment, the biggest and most costly manhunt in U.S. history is building to a crescendo. The target, Osama bin Laden. This is something that uh, we've been after for uh, 15 years. Uh, it goes back before 9-11. What would become known as Operation Neptune Spear began last July, when after years of painstaking intelligence gathering, a CIA operative spotted bin Laden's trusted courier, a man known as Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, in Peshawar, Pakistan. By August, he's been traced back to this large compound in the tourist town of Abbottabad, where he's living with his brother and their respective families. The compound has few outward-facing windows and high walls topped with electrified barbed wire. They had implemented some uh, very heavy security measures. The president is first briefed on the compound that same month. Throughout the fall, aggressive surveillance from the sky and from a nearby CIA safe house determines that another family is living there too, on the second and third floors of the main structure. The family fits the profile of the bin Ladens. Suspiciously, they're burning their own trash. And a tall man, referred to as the pacer by the spies, is seen walking in the courtyard. But it was all circumstantial. Uh, we never had direct evidence that he, in fact, had ever been there or was located there. Over the winter, the CIA's confidence in the target grows. In February, Director Leon Panetta meets with Vice Admiral William McRaven, head of Joint Special Operations Command, and tells him to prepare a mission plan. As winter turns to spring, the president chairs no less than five super-secret national security meetings on this topic. On March 14th, the option of a remote airstrike with B-2 bombers is offered and rejected. The president wants proof positive of bin Laden's death, not just a hole in the ground. If the operation is a go, it will be handled by the so-called silent option, the Navy SEALs. In April, units from SEAL Team 6 start training for the operation stateside using a mock-up of the compound to familiarize themselves with its every structure, wall, and entrance. They deploy for a staging base in Jalalabad, Afghanistan, late that month. The individuals who carried out this assault planned for all the various contingencies. Last Thursday, 4.30 p.m., the president tells his national security team he'll make a decision soon, but he needs more time to think and there's plenty to think about. The president has committed the American military to a third conflict, this one in Libya. Now is not the time for a high-profile fiasco, and the memories of prior failures, the botched rescue of the Iranian hostages in 1980, the Black Hawk Down disaster in Somalia in 1993, haunt the Situation Room. And just as troubling, the blown opportunity in 2001 to kill bin Laden in the caves of Tora Bora. We had the best intelligence case that we ever had on bin Laden since Tora Bora. Friday morning, 8.20 a.m., while billions of people are consumed by the spectacle of the royal wedding, 
President Obama meets again with his national security team and tells them it's a go. Immediately after green lighting the operation, the president flies to Alabama to tour the storm damage, while in Jalalabad, the SEAL team makes their final preparation. Saturday, the president calls Vice Admiral McRaven, himself a former SEAL, and tells him, it's in your hands, friend. But the operation is delayed. The weather's not right. In Jalalabad, the SEAL team goes through their checklist once again as they wait for the signal. The people of Pakistan and its military are blithely unaware of what's in the works. The biggest story of the day is a victory by the national cricket team. And West Indies, 14 for one. And in the States, the news is equally light. People think bin Laden is hiding in the Hindu Kush, but did you know that every day from four to five he hosts a show on C-SPAN? <laughs> Saturday night is the White House Correspondents' Dinner. I sit next to Admiral Mike Mullen, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's all small talk. You'd never know what was going on, while President Obama does some Oscar-worthy acting himself. My fellow Americans, <laughs> mahalo. It is wonderful to be here at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. What a week. But behind the scenes, in the Situation Room, White House staffers and the military are beginning to gather. Sunday morning, Director Panetta goes to church. The president takes in nine holes of golf. By 1 p.m., the National Security staff is now gathered in the Situation Room hooked into a live video feed from CIA headquarters. We had set up a, uh, an operations post here at the uh, CIA, and uh, I was in direct communication with Admiral McRaven, who was located uh, in Afghanistan. 2.05 p.m., 11.05 in Abbottabad. The operation is code green, and the Navy SEALs, the silent option, are slipping over the base of the Himalayas with public enemy number one in their crosshairs. 